So his best mate was doing the eulogy and I had a set time to interrupt and it was when basically a minute into the eulogy and I stood up and I said, uh, excuse me, John, sit the fuck down, shut up, the man in the coffin's got something to say. And I'd open the envelope, take the letter out and I'd read it. Have you ever wished to have the last word in an argument? Like actually the definitive last word where nobody can ever come back at you? Well, a private investigator in Queensland, Australia, called William Edgar, believes he has the answer. If you hire him, when you die, he'll turn up at your funeral and give everyone a piece of your late mind. To lend his voice to the departed, he charges around 10,000 Australian dollars for the service. He'll also rummage through your belongings after you pass, hiding anything you don't want your loved ones to see. I don't want to give too much away right now, but we'll talk about a pensioner's sex dungeon, a secretly gay biker, and some pretty crazy funeral clashes. You'll find him on at the Coffin Confessor on Instagram, and the same on Facebook. His website is thecoffinconfessor.com.au. Despite the gloomy topic, he's actually a lot of fun, and I love talking to such colourful characters. It's sort of the whole point of this podcast, so I hope you enjoy being transported now to his world. Warning to my father and all of our fathers and mothers, I think about 30% of his words are of the swearing variety. It does get a little colourful. It gets a little serious too. About halfway through, he brought up something I didn't know about, his childhood abuse, which sounds horrific. Look up The Lost Boy of TSS to know more about that. But it's fascinating how that sparked his enthusiasm for his current career. At the end of the podcast, I'll be reading out a couple of reviews and promoting the video versions and teasers and things uh, for its most enthusiastic fans. But for now, we're in Queensland, Queensland, I can't do the accent, Queensland from Australia. But for now, but for now, we're in Queensland, Australia to speak to the coffin confessor, Bill Edgar. How was that? So what happened to make it all kick off then? It's just one of those things, you know, that someone just grabbed it and went, you know what, this is a really unique idea. It was actually in the UK. I think it was this, you have the sun or something over there. Oh, yeah, yeah. So someone from the sun contacted me and he says, you may have the most unique job in the in the planet. And I'm <laughs> like, yeah, you reckon? He goes, mate, it's bizarre. It's out there. And I said, yeah, well, it is out there. Um and he said, look, I'll, I'll do an interview with you. How's it been going since COVID started? And I said to him, well, I had to set up a website because I was getting like, I was probably getting about 500 emails a night with people uploading their own uh, eulogies, messages of love, and they were getting scared about COVID and dying. So they thought, well, why not? And I went, wow, you know, it's just intriguing. Did COVID change things then for you? Oh, for sure. For sure, yeah. People started, yeah. I guess everybody started thinking about death and, you know, what they could leave their loved ones as a message or even those they love to hate, how they could tell them to fuck off. That's such a weird thing, isn't it, wanting to tell someone to fuck off after you die? (laughs) Oh, yeah, but you've got to think of it this way, right? Now, I've sat with these people and they've been knocking on death's door, right? Yeah. And they've been expecting their loved ones to come and visit them. And you know what? The loved ones are coming and fucking going through their personal belongings and and going through all this shit before they're even dead. So they can't actually say anything. They're on the deathbed. They can't do anything. They can't say anything. So they do it afterwards and they go, you know what, I feel gratified and satisfied that I can get this done after them and I'm going to let the whole world know what an absolute prick my best mate was or my brother or my son or whoever. I suppose they don't say anything at the time because part of them still wants them to come and visit while they're sort of dying. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the whole thing. I mean, I've been to funerals where I've told certain people to stand up, introduce themselves, and then I've told them to fuck off because they haven't seen my client in 30 years. Why are they there? Hmm. What, what right have they got to be there? If they're paying their respects when the guy's dead, why didn't you pay it when, they were, when he was alive? What the fuck's that about? It's yeah, sort of a social thing to show everyone that they were there. Of course it is. It's about respecting those left behind. It's not about respecting the man in the coffin. It's about disrespecting him and respecting and showing how good you are in front of everyone else. Has doing this job made you lose faith in sort of humanity? Because, I mean, are we just inherently selfish? Mate, we are, we're vultures. We're fucking terrible. Yeah. We are. 
we really are. It's 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 so sad to see the way it's going. And I, I didn't know about elder abuse. I'm like you hear about it, but fuck me, it is bad. Hmm. Like you know, you get these elderly parents living in their homes, and then their son or their daughter are nice, and they move back home with them. They care for them, then they kick them out. Well, they sign over all their assets and then they kick them out or they drop them off at a fucking nursing home and they never come back for them. And it's like, are you fucking kidding? They've taken out second or third mortgages on their properties and all that shit. What's that, mate? I think there's something beautiful about being to, able to admit to each other that we're quite selfish. Oh, bloody hell, there is. Absolutely. You know what? We get to a point in life where we start worrying about our own end of life and and where we're going to end up, you know. And and I keep thinking to myself, I've met so many now in nursing homes, palliative care, all that. You just don't want to go there. You really don't. It scares the fucking life out of me. It really does. How how old are you now? You know, I'm 52. All right. you got about 20 20 years, 25 years? Oh, you got at least 50. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Until until you're in one of those homes, though. Come on. (laughs) I, I keep myself very active and very fit, so I'm making sure my health before wealth. One of the people I spoke to on this podcast was a, a guy called Zoltan Istvan, who thinks we can live forever. He thinks uh, that that um, society and uh, technology has got to a point where we can, uh, in the next 10, 20 years, we'll be able to make ourselves live longer. So there's a bit of hope for us. Uh, who wants to do that? Fuck that. I've been here long enough. No, I'm yeah. saying, mate, what's going on now in the next generation, generation after that? You know, obviously we want our kids to have a better life, our grandkids to have a better life. But no one, I don't know anyone on the planet that works as hard as our generation did. We fucking work hard. You get people now, I employ people to come and do certain jobs and it takes them two days that I'd take fucking two hours to do. (laughs) And they're on their fucking phone. I never ran over to the phone box and ring my missus or girlfriend and went, oh, how are you? I mean, these guys are fucking hell. it, but that's the way society is now. Yeah. When you say our generation, I mean, that's too, we're, we're different generations. I just want to make that, that clear. Yeah, I know. I, I, I get, <laughs> you know, I'm talking 40s, 50s, you know. Yeah. I'm 31. You know, we, I look 40, but I'm 30. We really worked hard, our generation. I mean, and the generation before us. But I think the generation just after ours, like yours probably, is where it sort of became a, a thing to sort of, Sit back and go, you know, work isn't that important. I mean, we need it. We need the money, but it's not that important. And it fucking is. <laughs> it really is. This is the thing, though, and you've, you've had loads of experience up close with people as they're dying and, and all of their innermost wishes and stuff. And I, I'm sure you've seen closer than anyone that basically there are 7 billion of us in the world and every single one of us wants to be special, loved, important, and, and have the best, coolest jobs and things. And it's just impossible, unfortunately. Yeah, it's impossible for all of us, but you know what? It, it, it's, it's a possibility for some of us, and it's those people that never give up and keep striving to achieve. And and it's, you know, I've come up with that many things in my life, and I've failed at most. And, and seriously, I've failed at most, but I never give up. I just keep going. You know what I mean? And that's the, that's the whole thing about life is you've got to explore everything to the end. You don't just give up. You just keep going and going. If something knocks you down, okay, you get back up again. And, and that's a given. But I have, i, I got to say, my wife, uh, she's been in the same job for 24 years. Now, she's one of those people that knows how much she gets paid each week. She works nine to five. She's happy to do that. And God bless her, I'm happy that she does that because some months I might make a cent and I need to her back up, you know what I mean? Yeah. So when you work for yourself and you go forward, like you may know yourself, you might not get anything for a month or two. But then when it comes in, you go, oh, that's great. And I say to my wife, oh, you know, I just crashed a funeral, made 10 grand, and she'll go, oh, that's good. That's for the last 10 weeks you didn't work. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, oh, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. I mean... Yeah, I mean, I, I always hear that you always hear these stories, don't you? You know, like the Beatles or whatever re- were rejected seven times or something, and J.K. Rowling was rejected ten times or something before Harry Potter. And I, I think, like, I was rejected that many times before breakfast this morning. You know, they, they got it easy. What they rejected seven times? You're kidding me. But that's the life, isn't it? Yeah. So, so, so you started as a as a private detector, a detective. Sorry, what is a private detective? So I'm still a private detective, and what I do is I go. Uh, when you first start out as a private detective, you basically follow a spouse or someone cheating or shit jobs like that. 
I was very fortunate to be able to I have the gift of the gab when it comes to certain things, right? <laughs> and I walked into a, a resort one day, uh, quite a well-known resort around the world, and I spoke to the general manager and I said, uh, I bet you a year's salary that you've got a lot of theft in this place, right? And I bet you I can uncover it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, no worries. He says, okay, I'll give you an eight-week contract. If you find the theft, I'll pay you what you want. If you don't, then you pay me. And I'm like, yeah, no worries at all. So I went undercover as a uh, cleaner, believe it or not. And I was cleaning and I was making beds. And in the first week, I got in, I, I infiltrated all the cleaners and I'm like, how do you score a couple of towels and a couple of bed sheets and stuff like that? And they'd be going, oh, yeah, this is what you do. You put them in bags you put them in the rubbish, but you don't. You put them behind the rubbish bin, and when you end the shift, you just pick them up and you go. So for eight weeks, I was filming and monitoring how they, they got rid of sheets and towels and all that type of stuff. And then it ended up in the kitchen. They were taking sushi and, and salmon and steaks, and, and then in the bar they were taking alcohol, and, and it was rife, absolutely rife. And I had all this evidence, and I walked into the general manager's office to you go, know, Probably six weeks later, and I said, look, I said, I've got everything I need. I've got everything you need. You are in the middle of the worst theft I've ever seen. And he said, nah. And I said, look, watch this. And I left it with him. What he did with it was up to him. I ended up pocketing 12 grand for that job. I was happy. I was wrapped. And I ended up with a yearly contract for years. And it's still been going. It's been now, uh, what am I on, my 15th year. Right, so I have contracts with quite major hotels and motels where I go in and I impersonate a cleaner, a kitchen hand, a security guard, and I uncover the theft and fraud within the workplace. Wow. And that's my niche. That's where I sort of. I suppose there's a concern that if you do too many of these interviews, your face will get quite well known, and people will be saying, "Hang on, that cleaner's that same face as that private detective." Yeah, but you've seen Undercover Boss, haven't you? No. I'm the Undercover PI, so they, they don't notice me, you know. And, and in fact, if they do, you know what? At the end of the day, it's been a good run for 15 years. I've done what I've done. I have a company that's called Freedom from Debt Collectors. I don't know about debt collectors in the UK, but in Australia, they're, they're filthy, disgusting parasites. And I investigate debts sold by banks and finance companies, and I actually... Yeah, I've probably helped about you know thirteen and a half thousand people out of debt in the last few years. So that must be a nice feeling because you're helping people out. When you're sort of uncovering theft and that kind of thing, do you ever feel a bit bad because it's like they've told you they thought you were like in with them? And I suppose it's only petty theft, isn't it? And maybe they needed a bit of bread or whatever. Do you feel bad that you're sort of you know betraying them a little bit, or or is it just part of the job? Yeah, fuck them. I don't care. <laughs> I don't give a flying fuck. At the end of the day, they're a thief. And you know what? It, and this is the problem is that some people will say, oh, you know, you've got to be lenient. And I've got to say, when I was a repossessor and I was repossessing people's cars and things like that, that's when I felt bad about it because people couldn't pay a payment and they were losing stuff. And they actually owned it and they were trying to pay it back. And, and that's, that's a bad part of the job. But when you go into a motel and these people are going through other people's rooms and servicing them, and they're going through their belongings. No, oh, fuck them. They can go. You know, I, I stay at hotels, motels. My family does. We don't want our stuff going rifled with, you know. No. Are there other people like you who do that kind of job? I actually thought there was, but there's not. <laughs> I, was, I, I was astounded that I, I must be the only coffin confessor, the only debt person, you know, I'm the debt detective of Australia and the undercover PI, yeah. So. It's quite extraordinary. There's, there's, there's a movie in the making, surely. Has anyone ever talked to you about that? Uh, probably about 20 producers in the last two weeks. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. You're like a catch-me-if-you-can kind of guy. That's so funny. That's what the last guy just said. He said, I'm doing a show on you and it's going to be like catch-me-if-you-can. Yeah. yeah, it is a bit like that, except he was outside of the law, I suppose, but... but you yeah, know, well, and he uh, who who would play you? I, he could take my role too, though, if he wanted. Oh, Leo. Who was it? Uh, Leonardo, wasn't it? Yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio was, or one of those. Yeah. I see a resemblance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that would be a great movie. I found you because on Twitter, 
Uh, do you know QI, the British show uh, with Stephen Fry? It was like a quiz show where they. Sh- oh was- yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they, they, I just, I think I follow their Twitter or something and they just put out facts or something. There was no interview with them. Oh, they just tweeted out saying, you know, in Australia, you can get your own coffin confessioner who comes yeah. to the funerals That's and so right. on. Yeah, I saw that tweet and I went, nah. So I typed it in expecting <laughs> that there'd be loads of them. I thought it meant like it was a profession and it was, it was just you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think I've got um, 394 resumes that have come in in the last three weeks just for people that want to do it around the globe. Wow. Incredible. Well, they want you to sort of set them up. Yeah, they want a franchise. They want me to franchise so they can go around and do it. And what are you going to do? Not do that. No? <laughs> no, no. Look, I'm the only coffin confessor. I, I, I've got, uh, I think I've got four funerals in the waiting in, in the UK. Uh, I'll fly over and do those. Um, they paid the deposits. It's non-refundable. Um, so I'll go and crash those funerals when they go. I've got a few in um, New Zealand uh, and around the world, you know. I've got, yeah. But since setting up the website, thousands of people have uploaded their own eulogies, you know, or confessions or even messages of love, you know. Yeah. So it's been good. How did you get started on this? Yeah, so I was investigating a, um, uh, the finances for a client um, he was being ripped off by his accountant and I was, he asked me to investigate and I did. And, and then we got close and we got to start talking and he said that he'd, uh, he had terminal illness and he hadn't long to live. And we started talking about uh, the death, you know, and on the other side and what's happening and everything else. And uh, I said to him, why don't you do a eulogy? Why don't you do your own video, your own eulogy, do, write something, do something special, you know? And he said, no. Nah. He said, the family won't play it. He said, someone in the family will go, no, nah, it's too confronting or it's not, it, it'll never be done. So I jokingly said, oh, mate, I could always crash your funeral for you. And about three weeks later, I get this text off him and he goes, you're on, crash my funeral for me. Let's get together. Uh, I'm going to pay you 10 grand. And I'm like, I never set the fee. I never, ever set the fee of how much it was. That's how the fee started, the 10 grand. And I said to him, well, what are we going to do? And he says, my best mate is trying to screw my wife. And I said, well, yeah, I could get up and say that, but what have we got that shows me that? You know, and I'm a factual investigator. I need to know a little bit of fact at least, you know. And he said, well, how about we film him? And I'm like, okay, no worries. I've got some devices that we can put in your room and put in the kitchen and put in the lounge room. Not a problem. So I did. And, uh, yeah, fuck me if it wasn't true. This bloke was all over his wife. His wife was just leave me alone. And this guy was full on, just kept hassling, hassling. Yeah, he'd spill a drink on his shirt and take it off and just a real fucking wank, mate. Absolute wank. And uh, so I had that evidence and then I sat with my client and I said, yeah, I said, this is full on. I said, okay, no worries. We're crashing your funeral. What else do you want done? He says, well, there's going to be three people there at the funeral. Uh, there's going to be my brother, his wife, and their daughter. I want you to tell them to stand up, introduce themselves, and then I want you to tell them to fuck off because I haven't seen them in 30 years. And that's sort of how it started. So, yeah. And then someone from that funeral saw me and they said, my auntie is dying. She needs to see you. And then it took off. Wow. That conversation is so filmic, isn't it? I can imagine the scene in the film. I know I keep going back. Oh, yeah. that. <laughs> you're talking to this, this dying guy because yeah. you, you say you're, you're describing it in a very happy-go-lucky way, but essentially you're talking about the man's death. Was he dying yeah. soon? Uh, he died. So it was three weeks after I said I'd crash his funeral and he died nine days later, I think, after that. So it wasn't far. Yeah. Yeah. Christ. So this was real deathbed stuff. Pancreatic cancer he had. That's a horrible one. Yeah, that's the worst one you can get. Yeah. Oh. It was very sad because he was there at a stage of pain and morphine and drugs and everything else, but he was also at a stage where he was incapacitated. He couldn't confront his best mate, and that was the, the hardest part because in his day he probably dragged his best mate out by the throat and kick him in the head, you know what I mean? But he was yeah. incapacitated. He was totally screwed. He lost a lot of weight. Somebody yeah, you just needed somebody. And, and you know what? I, I guess I was just that somebody. And I, I didn't give a fuck. You know, I, after what I saw, 
I've got a wife and kids too. I don't want my best mate doing that to my wife. You know, it'd be the worst feeling in the world. Yeah, I can't imagine that really. But no one ever imagines uh, it happening to them. But I guess he knew, didn't he? He had an idea. So how did that go down at the funeral, especially when you said fuck off to his uh, his uh, sibling or whatever? Oh, they quickly left those ones. Yeah, his best mate. You know, so that first funeral, I interrupted the, uh, the his best mate doing the eulogy. So his best mate was doing the eulogy and I had a set time to interrupt and it was when basically a minute into the eulogy and I stood up and I said, uh, excuse me, John, uh, sit the fuck down, shut up, the man in the coffin's got something to say. And I'd open the envelope, take the letter out, and I'd read it. <laughs> and that's what came out. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Man, were you not – I mean, I would be so nervous thinking, God, in one minute I've got to stand up and interrupt everything. Yeah, you know what? At very first uh, – I guess I was at very first, but I've got to say, after watching this guy and knowing what he did, I just didn't give a fuck. I, I felt really good. I felt, yeah, I'm going into bat for this bloke. And I felt, yeah, fuck them. Yeah, how dare he do that? You know, so I, I, it sort of didn't worry me. And then a lot of people around sort of said, oh, Jesus Christ, what's going on here? And there was a lot of emotion. There's a lot of angst. But at the same time, it was their loved one lying in the coffin and they wanted to hear what he'd left unsaid. And it was good because once you get the crowd on your side, Believe me, you've got you've got an open flavour. You can do what you want. Man, it's quite exciting. It can be, yeah, for sure. So the other thing you do, have you ever seen that? There's a there's a series called uh, is it, well, I don't know what they'd call it in in German. It's Tatort Reiniger, and in English, it's like the cleaner. It's a series where this guy goes into people's houses after they die, and he sort of cleans up everything afterwards. It's a little bit different. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's different to what you do. His job is literally to clean the houses, and then he usually sort of uncovers. It's a comedy, and he uncovers a clue, or uh, oh, okay. you know, yeah. finds it's still alive, or or he, he overhears yeah. the arguments of the siblings about their money and that kind of thing. So it's quite funny. Oh, I got you. Yeah, so I go in and I, I remove items from the people knocking on death's door have already told me where those items are. Yeah. Um, and it can be money, drugs, it can be pornographic, sex toys, it can be anything. Um, but they give me a list. They ask me to go to the house. They give me a key. They tell me where a key is or they tell me how to get in. Um, and, and I'll go to that property and I'll, I'll remove items. Um, and then I, I film that and I film them being incinerated and then I take it back to my client and they go oh great so much thank you you know I'm not embarrassed if my daughters or sons or family find them okay so it's not it's not I thought it might be done after they die or something but it's done while they're still alive it, it's usually done yeah it's it's I've had a couple of clients who after they died yes obviously I've got the message you know to say from and it's usually someone in the family that's contact me and say hey Bill um my uncle's died. Um, can you race over to his property? He's got some stuff in there that if the family find it, they're going to fucking put him in an unmarked grave because he's yeah. he's bad person. You know what I mean? So, yeah. What's the worst stuff you've found? Oh, I, I suppose not the worst, but the most confronting was an 88-year-old gentleman that had a fall and he was taken to hospital and he was told he'd never return home and he went into palliative care and... When I sat with him and spoke with him, he said, what I'm going to find is going to be confronting, but he's got three sons, three daughter-in-laws, and he did not, for the life of him, want them to find what he had at home. Now, he kept saying, you're going to be confronted, and blah, 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 and this is the key, this is the door, this is where you've got to go, this is what you'll find. And I get to this property and, you know, it's a, it's a sex dungeon. Like, seriously, for an 88-year-old man, it was... Just there was some shit in there that I'd never seen in my life. I didn't even know how that worked or what, what the fuck was going on. And it was incredible. It was just like, you're fucking kidding me. Like, yeah. 88, who was this play? What, what the fuck? <laughs> and you had, you had no yeah. idea before you, he didn't say to you, there's going to be a sex dungeon there. Yeah, he did say it was that. Uh, and I, <laughs> I was like, yeah, big deal. I've seen shit before, but no, nah, not like that. That was yeah, extreme shit. There was money as well that he wanted me to uh, retrieve and give to his son, um, not not all three sons, just one of the sons. And it was like, you know, there's a debt, a repayment of a debt and things like that. But, you know, there's issues that he had with his family. But, you know, he pointed out certain specific 
things he wanted done and they got done. Wow. Has there ever been anything that you've been asked to do that you didn't want to, that you were like, I'm not doing that? I killed a dog. An elderly gentleman was dying and he wanted to take his dog with him. He wanted me to go and euthanize his dog. And uh, I rehomed the dog. I couldn't. I mean, you're not going to kill someone's dog. But at the same time, the dog died pretty much soon afterwards. But at the same time, it was was heartbreaking for him. And a lot of people go, you can't take your dog. This poor dog. I mean, the dog was nearly 16 years old. He couldn't hear, couldn't see. I mean... But at the same time, I'm not there to take the life of anyone. I'm, I'm a messenger. That's all I am. Wow, it sounds quite scary, actually. Like, uh, I'm not here to take the life of anyone. I'm just a messenger. Well, that's all I am. I, and that's what I say to people. Don't shoot the messenger, especially when I go to funerals. And, and the bikey's funeral, I do, you know, disclose he was gay and that his lover was in the crowd. And they want to rip me head off. And I'm going, don't shoot the messenger. It's the guy in the coffin's confession. This is what he wanted to say. If you don't want to listen to it, fuck off. You know, and they yeah. go, well, you fuck off. And I'll be like, yeah, I'll take the client with me then. And they go, well, you can't take, yeah, I can. I've got another hearse. I've got another undertaker over there. I can take the client anytime I want. So this was when you turned up at a, a well, they're a biker gang and it was a funeral and you, yeah. were, you were there to tell them that, that he had been gay and that his lover was, was there at the funeral. Yeah, exactly. I guess he just wanted everyone to know. It was, you know, I got to, I suppose you put it this way, right? Those that truly knew this man knew he was gay. You know what I mean? They knew. <clears throat> I think it was a, a way of um, him just coming out and going, you know what? I don't give a fuck. I was yeah. gay. I don't care. You know, I, sure, I didn't want to say it was alive, but fuck you all. I'm gone. See you in hell. See you in heaven. See you wherever. You know, and that was it. You know, so. I would be yeah. so scared to turn up at a biker's funeral and say that. Yeah, it's intimidating, I tell you, because, I mean, I, I don't fear anything usually, you know, but you walk in there and, yeah, they, they'll start going, oh, you know, this guy or who's this bloke coming, you know, and, it's, yeah, and I'm wearing a fucking suit and they're all wearing leathers and shit and whatever they wear, you know, and I, I'm in a suit, you know. Mm. And there's odd people there in suits as well, but I just sort of stuck out like a bit of a sore thumb at that one. But at the same time, as soon as I said who I was and who I was there for on behalf of, you know, three quarters of them really wanted to know what I was doing there and wanted to know what their best mate had left unsaid. And as soon as they heard that, they were like, yeah, cool. Are you sitting through the whole services and stuff beforehand and people are sort of wondering, who's that fella? Do you know him? Yeah, sometimes, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it depends when I've got to interrupt. Yeah. Um, at that biking one, obviously, we're all standing around the grave. Um, and obviously, you have the, uh, the mum, dad and friends sitting in plastic seats at the front of the, the grave. But, uh, yeah, we're all sort of standing around and you're listening to it. And then there's a certain moment that we've discussed with my client when I'm to interrupt. Um, there was one service uh, where a, a priest was told to sit down and shut up because my client didn't want a religious funeral. Uh, he didn't take that well. Uh, yeah. But at the end of the day, he, he had no choice but to take it. He was told by you? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, it's a priest. I mean, uh, to be honest with you, I have no care, respect or concern for priests. I, I know what they do and what they've done in, in their past, so fuck them. Mm. Fair enough. I take it you're not very religious. I am, no, not at all. No. You know, people say to me all the time about religion and pedophilia and church and all that. And, and like, you know, I, I went to the best school in Australia. I won an award, five year scholarship to the best school in Australia where I got fucking raped, abused, sodomized, bashed, belittled by teachers, staff, you know, everyone there. You know, I've been fighting that for years, for 35 years, and it's only come to fruition now because I'm getting some notoriety. If you Google the lost boy of TSS, you'll notice that I have named and shamed every teacher that ever touched me, abused me, and 133 boys have come forward and said the same thing. So really, you know, I have no care or concern for priests and and the religion, and uh, I believe, you know, that in my religion, in my beliefs anyway, it's not religion, it's that you do right, you'll go to the right place. That's it. Don't hurt anybody. You know, just do the right thing. Wow, I didn't know all of that. I mean, so 
Do you think that might have sh- <laughs> shaped your career decision in a way? If, of course it did. Yeah, you're writing the wrongs of other people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was seven years of age. I mean, you know, yeah, from seven to 15. You know, I, I was, yeah, my, my, I had my childhood ripped from me. That My own mother sold me to her father as a sex slave, you know, at the age of seven. Shit, man. But that's, it makes you who you are today. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. That's horrific. But yeah, so so, in what way do you think it's affected your career path? Oh, I think it's become. Uh, I've always sort of been the voice for those that don't have one or are scared to stand up and say something. And it's a very hard thing to do for a man to stand up and say, "Oh, you know, I was working abused and molested and raped at school, and this and that happened." But at the end of the day, I wasn't a man. I was a fucking seven-year-old boy. I was a kid. Yeah. You know. And it was in the 1980s, yeah. you know. It was a different era. Boy, kids were seen and not heard back then. You went out when the sun came up. You came back home when the street lights went on, and that was it. You were seen and not heard. No one gave a fuck. They are now, though. You're doing the confessions for people who can't. Yeah. That's nice, man. That's a really good way of sort of redressing the wrongs. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why I think I've got that little bit of attitude where – it doesn't worry me going into a church and standing up and telling people, you know, sit down, shut up, or fuck off. I, I really don't. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been through enough in my life, you know, that I don't have to worry about that, you know. I really don't. Fucking hell, man. That's crazy, that stuff. So I was wondering, you know, you get into people's houses when they give you a key and stuff. Is it committing a crime getting in there? No. And this is the thing I've got to be very careful of. Um, I can't commit a crime. So I need to have access. So it has to be either they tell me how to get in, Mm. um, and and I I, obviously I videoed all this. Yeah. So I've got actual, you know, because I mean, recently I did attend a property. uh, There was a key. I opened the door. I went in and I destroyed a will. The lady wanted her will destroyed because her daughters uh, were just horrific on her deathbed. And after I destroyed the will, the next thing I had to do was phone one of the daughters up and say, guess what, I've just ended your mum's home and I've destroyed the will. Have fun fighting over what's left. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, that didn't go over too well. She called the police and the police gave me a call and they said, oh, you know, you can't do that. And I said, yeah, I can. And they said, well, you can't. And I said, we'll prove it. And they came and see me. I showed them the video and they said, well, you can't, sorry. (laughs) <laughs> and there's nothing they could do. So oh. I make sure that I can be properly covered. I can't be litigated or arrested. You have to really brush up on your law. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing. You see, I guess in my field, I do brush up on it a lot. And it's like when I very first started this, I said to people, if you tell me what the crime is, I've got to, I've, I've really got to report it. So now people, I've said to people, if you've got a serious crime, do not tell me. Put it in an envelope, address it to me, post it to me. If I don't open it, I don't know what it is. I'll be as surprised as every other fucker at the funeral when I open it and read it. Uh, I'm trying to understand the law here. So yeah, The law is, is that basically if you don't know it, you can't report it. So you're not then in trouble for not reporting it, but then you reveal it at the funeral. Once I open it and read it, I've got to report it. Okay. Wow. How do they know that you'll uh, go through with it? Yeah, that, look, that's, that's probably the biggest question that a lot of people have asked is like, you know, why wouldn't you just take their money and run? You know, they don't know you're going to go through with it. They, don't, they have no idea. And you know what? I don't need the money. Mm. Um, it's not about the money. And at the same time, I don't work for a bank. So therefore, only a bank takes a dead person's money. And I'm not one of those people <laughs> So yeah. I, I don't even worry about that type of shit. You know, I, I'm paid to do a job and I do the job. The money sits in a trust account and it's not touched until I've actually you know, done the job. My wife and I, we've come from absolutely nothing. We lived in a tent when we had our first child. You know, we had nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, today, we've worked so hard. We, we own farms, properties, cars. You know, we're self-made and that's, that's something that I take a lot of pride in. Um, and I suppose when you look at it, my childhood, my background, it, it, it stops me from doing anything like that. I, I really have a, a negative thing about theft and, and 
taking something that's not mine or pretending to be someone you're not. I hate that. I fucking hate business coaches that come along and they go, oh, I'll coach your business. That fucking annoys me because either they failed in their business and they've got nothing else to do, so they become a business fucking coach. Yeah. Like that annoys me. You know, yeah. but anyway, getting off track. But, yeah, I guess uh, there's a lot of trust. There is a lot of trust. And at every funeral, somebody knows that I'm going to be there. They don't know what's going to happen, but I make sure that my client tells somebody in their family that they can honestly trust that I'm going to be there. Like a coffin confessor, coffin confessor. Yeah, basically. They just know that, yeah, they, they might tell. Like my first client, he told his daughter, he said to his daughter, he said, look, this gentleman named Bill, he's going to be attending the funeral. Let him go with it. It's my request, my wishes. And she was great. You know, one guy stood up and she said, look, sit down, dad's organised this. You said the first time was 10K. Does the price vary depending on the job? Yeah, it does. It does now because um, I, I've met a lot of people that they haven't got 10 grand. You know, they've only got a couple hundred or a thousand bucks or $4,000, you know, so it does vary and it depends where I've got to travel to and what I do. Um, the set fee of 10 grand though, it weeds out those people wanting to do it just for fun or spite or revenge because it doesn't work that way. So if someone's going to pay 10 grand or even four, four and above, they're going to be serious and legitimate. You know what I mean? They're not going to spend that amount of money just to make jokes. And I, I haven't met one person yet on their deathbed that's lied. Hmm. You know, you don't lie on your deathbed. They know where they're going. Yeah. You know? You're not going to lie. It's a weird thought, though, because 10K, I don't like the idea of spending 10 grand on anything, but if I'm going to be dead, I think it devalues it a little bit. Yeah, I, you know, every client said the same thing. They don't need the money where they're going, and I've never had a complaint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet you haven't. Oh, man, it's a cool job. How long have you been doing this part of it? Uh, in 2017, so nearly three years. What's the main takeaway you've had, I suppose, philosophically speaking? People are fucking prudes. <laughs> no, um, uh, I think the main thing I've taken away from it is that uh, we all need to look after ourselves because at the end of the day, no one's going to do it for you. Um, despite how much love and devotion you think they have, you make sure you have a backup plan, always have a back door, always make sure that you've got you know, everything covered because the greed and all that just comes in. So, I mean, yeah, I, I think I've taken away that. I've taught a lot of people lately that don't trust. Okay? No matter what, trust in yourself. Yeah, I know it's hard and I know it's not a nice thing to say, but that's, that's the way it is. You know, when you're on your deathbed, you're gone. They don't need this. See you later. You know, and that's, that's it. Wow. Don't trust anyone. Well, you can't. I mean, I know it's hard and I know it's a terrible thing to say, but at the same time, these people have trusted their families for years, you know, and they're lying on their deathbed and all they see them going through their shit and giving up assets before they're gone. They turn into vultures. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, hmm. it's really bad. It really is. Have you found yourself becoming quite emotional and attached in certain circumstances? Uh, yeah, I guess... I, <laughs> I don't know if it's an emotional thing, but every client that's died, I've said to them, come back, tell me what it's like. Do give me a sign, do something. You know, for the love of God, do something so I know there's something out there. You know, I've got nothing. There's nothing that's come in. There's no sign, there's nothing. Um, yeah, and a few of them will say, oh, yeah, well, I'll make sure that you know, I put your name at the pearly gates for you. And I'm like, fuck the gates. Just fucking get me in there for free, whatever, you know. But... There's nothing, you know, they, they just go to sleep and that's it, you know. And if there is something out there, we're not to know, you know. And that's why I've created a few other things lately, you know, Death's Dinny. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of that yet, but uh, yeah. that'll be coming out soon. What's that? So, Death, well, it's like Destiny, but it's Death's Dinny. Okay. Um, and everybody on this planet has a Death's Dinny, which is a time that they're going to die. You don't know what it is but everybody on this planet has one. And, uh, yeah, it's something I'm writing at the moment about when when your time is and uh, what if you were to run in somebody that really knew what time you were going to die, what date, time and exact time you were going to die, would you pay them for that information or would you let it go? No, you don't want that information. Unless you can change it. 
Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, unless you could change it. Yeah. Is that, so that's like a fiction you're writing? Yeah, it is. It is a bit of a fiction, yeah. Yeah, I've got to say there's a little bit of truth to it too, though. You know, there's a little bit. There's elements of truth there. Yeah, so these are these are writings? What, what is it? Yeah, this is a book I'm writing. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm doing, I'm doing three books, actually. I'm doing The Coffin Confessor, The Coffin Caller, and Death's to Me. You must be bloody busy. I enjoy it, though. Yeah. The Coffin Caller, a good one. Yeah, what's that? Is that biographical? That's, uh, no, that's actually a guy that uh, he, he uh, kidnaps people and he uh, puts them in coffins and he leaves them with their mobile phone. He drugs them and then when they wake up, they've only got their mobile phone and they can only call him for help. Oh. And he'll only let them out if they, they engage the coffin confessor to confess certain things. Wow. So he, he chooses certain people that have committed some serious crimes and stuff. That's quite cool. Yeah, pretty would, cool, eh? Yeah. Would you like to be that good guy who gets the call? <laughs> I don't know. I don't yeah. know. There's a fucking scary one. <laughs> That guy who gets a call fucking puts him in the coffin. No, I don't want to do that shit. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, yeah, that's not going to be you then. Um, no, no. What's, what's the future for you then? So apart from the books, and, and uh, are you expanding? Are you going to keep keep doing this around the world? Oh, yeah, I'll keep doing it for as long as people need it. Done. I mean, everyone on this planet has a story. Everybody's got a skeleton in the closet. It just depends how many people want to open them up and let them out. I'll be there for sure. Not a problem. Um, the future? Uh, mate, I'm inundated with requests for drama series, movies, books, you name it. Uh, there's only, the, you know, one producer rang me tonight and his quote was, where is it? But there's only ever been one Batman. You know, and I'm like, yeah, but there's been a lot of people playing Batman. And he's like, yeah, but there's only one Batman and there's only one coffin confessor. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. Fair enough. All right. I'm quite excited for this future. I'm going to keep an eye on on you and everything that's going on because <laughs> I would definitely watch that film and I'd be like, I spoke to him when that when that all comes out. And you never know, like time, you know, it's just a time factor, isn't it? Someone can mm. just grab it and run with it. I mean, who knows? Yeah.